Cardiac resynchronization therapy is one of the other important devices as well, which is important to maintain the resynchronization between the different chambers of the heart. Different chambers means especially is the left ventricle and of course the right ventricle as well. So in our earlier sessions, we have already spoken about uh, the how to interpret the ECG of the CRT, otherwise uh, how to, what are the indications, what are the different way of programming as well. Then now today we will try to speak also about what goes in, like whenever uh, device implantation is being scheduled. So what happens is it is actually like a six step uh, process. Six step process in the sense like first thing is yes, try to cannulate the coronary sinus. And then uh, of course, uh, before that you can plan for a uh, coronary sinus a venogram. And then you also have to target a vein, target the vein. So I, I'll try to share you some of those criteria as well. How can one decide upon those criteria, like how to decide which vein to be targeted, in fact. Similarly, then uh, you have to place, of course, the lead over there. And after doing that, the, the tool which has been used uh, for implantation, those tools need to be uh, removed. And finally, you have to check for the electrical and programming device. And once you are done, you are done and you can go home happy. So, so the indications and the other programming tips and all, we have already spoken in other lectures. So as I said, it, I will try to focus a little bit more on the procedure itself. What happens for the resynchronization therapy? So that is what is really, really important. So one of the important things is, uh, as I hopefully you can already understand. So most of these patients are already having a left bundle branch block. However, so if you will accidentally bump on the right bundle, you may cause complete heart block. So backup pacing must always be available. And even in that, so that is one of the reasons what we try to see is first, uh, the RV lead should be implanted because it can not only be used all, uh, for uh, providing the backup pacing, but also it can help uh, to give you a landmark for the coronary sinus ostium. Okay. And uh, further, you will be able to visualize the tricuspid valve as well, so which will help you to locate the coronary sinus ostium. Sometimes, don't forget, uh, it may be difficult to cannulate the coronary sinus uh, with the lead implanted. So that is why sometimes uh, if uh, you are really finding the RV lead implantation difficult, so what you can do is implant the LV lead first. Okay, so then sometimes what happens is when you're trying to put the lead in the RV position a lot of times always try to look out for the ectopy if you do not see those ectopies uh, ventricular ectopies whenever you're putting the RV lead be suspicious that you are somewhere in the coronary sinus so that is why sometimes it may be easier to cannulate the coronary sinus and yes uh, even that can be used as a backup pacing as well. But don't forget that, yes, CS lead can uh, easily get also dislodged as well. So what happens is, so some of the important things for this is, uh, we should be knowing that we may need a longer wire, especially if we are thinking of cannulating uh, with the axis of the subclavian vein because from subclavian vein it has to come down further towards the RV or do finally towards the coronary sinus so that is why it can be pretty uh, long and minimum use a nine french axis nine french axis so for example the cs guide catheter is normally placed through this uh, introducer and then after that you should have already prepared all the delivery components for example uh, flushing the lumen and then for example you should have tested the uh, venogram balloon catheter and wet the guide catheter as well with the heparinized solution 
apply solution is very important. So what you are trying to do is during the venogram. So during the venogram, you try to visualize the how is the coronary sinus anatomy. So for example, here is the balloon, and then the final results. So when you have placed the bipolar lead uh, as well. So the first important step is cannulating the coronary sinus. So we should have a clear understanding about the anatomy, anatomy of the right atrium especially, in the sense where is the tricuspid annulus, which we can see, the coronary sinus, which is sometimes the eustachian valve can be very much prominent over there, and then comes the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and the thepsian valve as well, sometimes can be prominent. And whenever if it is prominent, it can be difficult uh, to be taken care of. So that's why it is very, very important. But to help us for the cannulation, there are various catheters which is available, either from the St. Jude uh, Medical or also... Uh, which can be sometimes pre-shaped curve, okay, and sometimes the fixed shape catheters as well, which are most commonly used as well. So always try to see uh, how is the size of the heart. So for example, left ventricle versus the, uh, if the LV is very dilated, the right atrium or the RV is enlarged, or even the orientation of the coronary sinus os as well. So what I uh, like a lot of people tend to prefer is try to start with a simple curve simple curve and then you can start going for the more advanced uh, curves in fact so as you can see it over here so there are various uh, these are the various options which is available the straight uh, deep seater 45s 50s 57s okay Otherwise, sometimes you can also think of using is the multipurpose right catheter. And um, even the curve shape selection as well on the basis of, uh, you can think of different uh, options are available. Even when we are trying to see, so something is called as the extended hook. Extended hook is, uh, uh, we will be able to across uh, reach across a, the, if there is a large dilated right atrium, okay, and um, uh, there are some options even for this, the extended hook, or extended hook extra large. So if the you have a very hugely dilated right atrium, you may consider. Similarly, so this is the one. If uh, you are having a, uh, you are expecting a block in the coronary sinus. So, for example, you have tried to pass on the catheter. You're still not able to uh, move around at all and uh, you expect a thepsian valve as well so then uh, you can think for that so in this okay now we are aware of the different options available a little bit of the anatomy as well so the first thing first so first thing first is of course you have to try to uh, obtain a venous axis you do need to do the flushing and after that, you attach the valve to the catheter hub. After doing that, you have already dilated through the valve and catheter. Then finally, what you do is the, you pass the guide catheter assembly over the long introducer guide wire through the introducer sheath to the atrium. Always use a guide wire. Whenever you are trying to do anything in the heart, always use a guide wire. So once you reach over there, then you can remove the dilator. And after that, whenever you're doing the thing, always remember is counterclockwise. So it should not be clockwise, but counterclockwise means opposite. So whenever you are trying to put it from this, you try to do is a counterclockwise turn. And then after that, I try to advance the guide uh, catheter at least few centimeters inside only then because it will be helpful that you will be able to engage the coronary sinus and after you have done that um, yeah sometimes if you're not careful enough people may be able to dissect or even perforate you know, the, uh, this in fact so then after that um, 
yeah if it is really becoming difficult you may even consider to use a ep catheter so it, for the ep catheter what you can do is obtain a venous axis put up the sheath guide wire you have already put it up just put it up uh, a steerable ep catheter and you have to put it into the right atrium and finally access the coronary sinus and what is the alternative option is you try to do the probing coronary sinus technique so what happens is if because most most of those patients uh, will already be having severe heart failure therefore the heart will already be enlarged re can be very enlarged as well so it can be really sometimes difficult uh, to be able to cannulate uh, the coronary sinus so then what you do is you use a curved cs cannulation catheter and you try to put it as the low right atrium and then apply a counterclockwise rotation okay counterclockwise facing the left posterior and yeah, uh, one can use also a coronary guide wire with a J-shaped curve to probe the ostium of coronary sinus. And when uh, someone has reached the coronary sinus, you try to proceed the guide wire into the lateral wall or LV or even the great cardiac vein. And you keep tracking as well. And finally, you put the CS catheter into the CS trunk. After you have done that, you try to do the coronary sinus venogram. So this is how it looks like. So in this, always remember that you try to inflate up to like 10 millimeters, okay? Don't use a huge uh, syringe. Uh, so you use like a 1.25 ml syringe, in fact, and you lead always, as I said, any intervention in the heart one is planning, it should always be led with a guide wire and then after placing it there the balloon can be inflated and deflated several times to be able to be double sure and then finally the contrast solution can be injected through the catheter so this is how you it looks like so especially in the ap and if you will try to look at the different views then you notice over here the cardiac venous anatomy and the lead placement so then the important things com comes is about the uh, biventricular pacing is whenever we are trying to implant the leads of the crt so how does it look like so always keep in mind the uh, venous anatomy especially in the different views in the different views it may look slightly different in the sense you should be able to keep in mind about the mid cardiac vein anterior cardiac vein and the posterior cardiac vein so this is the one in anterior mid and posterior okay and of course the great cardiac vein so great cardiac vein most commonly you can see especially in the lao okay and in the rao you will be able to see the posterior cardiac vein lao will be for the great cardiac vein and rao will be for the posterior cardiac vein and then uh, our own leads as well of the pacemaker pacemaker in the sense so it will be the atrial lead rv lead and the lv lead so there can be some problems as well problems whenever you're trying to perform a cs venogram for example you have to slowly inflate the balloon and you have to keep on checking the balloon size as well balloon size in the sense so is it becoming oval or what shape is it uh, is it occluding it well or not so sometimes, if you are using an oversized balloon, one can even, uh, while inflating uh, the balloon, one can even uh, dissect it, actually. So one should be careful if the balloon catheter is advanced into a branch vein. 
So if you advance it into the branch vein, there is risk for uh, dissection as well. So one should really be uh, careful if the balloon is put too distal into the coronary sinus and uh, may have missed sometimes those uh, the different branches. So that is why the different views are very, very important. So once we have understood this, so the next important thing is how to select the target vein and the left ventricular lead. So for this, Oh, the target most of the times is left ventricular free wall. Free wall, it includes the lateral wall, the posterolateral, or even the anterolateral. Okay, the lateral segment, the anterolateral, and the posterolateral. And the not so suboptimal, uh, not so good positions are like in the middle cardiac vein or the great cardiac vein, in fact. Okay, so that is very, very important. Similarly, uh, we have to think also for the 3D mapping of the optical optimal LV pacing site. So what happens is uh, the uh, there has been shown a recent role of the three-dimensional mapping as well. So using which one can try to see the earliest activation time and during which uh, one can even pace and go through and in fact, various studies has shown as well that for non-responders or the late responders, one can able to get a good sweet spot where it will increase the pacing responding rate as well for the pacing. Sometimes it's always impo also important like which CS vein not to be selected. So what happens is if there is an anterior cardiac vein, for example, for the high septal pacing, otherwise middle cardiac vein, especially for the low septal pacing, otherwise for the septal pacing, of course, if you are unable to pre-excite the delayed LV free wall. And yes, uh, one of the exceptions for such kind of cases is anastomosis. So what we always try to see is a location in the vein that is located at the free wall of the LV, especially, which is most of the times is like a lateral vein or a posterolateral lateral vein but could be a posterior vein which runs lateral and upwards or even other veins with anastomosis so you always try to prefer a superior or mid level of lv rather than an apical or diaphragmatic side so you try to uh, see for a lao or a ra view to confirm the location of the tip of lv lead and a vein with decent size and depth to accommodate the LV lead and minimize the size of dislodgement. And uh, always try to be careful, especially also about the phrenic nerve stimulation. Because that can be a common thing which can happen for such kind of patients. So there are uh, different LV leads which is available from different companies uh, like the Medtronic tends to have a unipolar, bipolar as well. So in the unipolar uh, leads, uh, yeah, it is, uh, so you can try to place, uh, especially in the smaller veins. So if the veins are really small and there's huge tortuosity and all, so you can try to use a unipolar. However, if good enough size is there, you can try to use, of course, a bipolar as well. And yes, uh, you can always track them uh, those veins as well very well so you try to attain a star fix so in that what happens is you have to do is a active fixation so even in the lv lead as well it needs active fixation so uh, although the lobes are pretty soft and very malleable i would say as well easy to deploy and there are some retention sleep sheets as well so that is something really nice. And then comes the attainability. Attainability is like the the first four French bipolar LV lead. So it is pretty flexible. And even if there are some difficult anatomies as well, it is easy to uh, use. And also, if you're trying to use a hybrid guide wire, it's pretty helpful, in fact. So... There are some uh, leads like the Performa, 
which has a deliberate design. Deliberate design is uh, in the sense like, as you can see, there are sometimes the CS anatomy can be difficult, uh, which can be sometimes large, low tortuous vessels. So then you can use this 4598. Otherwise, sometimes if there's a small, high tortuous vessels, then you can use 4298. Uh, the other uh, one, I mean, 4298, 4598, 4398. So there are different models available. So, but what happens is these leads usage will depend upon the anatomy of the coronary sinus uh, venogram, which you would have done. And then there are active fixation leads as well. Active fixation, so what will happen is they are also pretty small in the sense like four, again, four French itself. And uh, it, they are very stable. However, uh, what happens is whenever you're trying to do the extraction, sometimes one has to be a bit careful. As you can see in the diagram over here, this is how it looks like. So because uh, sometimes I'll tell you, so even for your examination, uh, um, practical questions can be asked. So which lead to be selected? So, for example, you may be asked to come and assist in the lab. So, you may be asked which type of lead one should consider, especially for the resynchronization therapy. And it will be important to be able to understand. So, for example, if someone says uh, quartet LV lead, or sometimes one says no, quick flex uh, a model, I will try to prefer. So, what are the reasons? So, it will depend upon, so for example, uh, on the do you want steerable uh, distal tip or not? Do you want a, a guide wire driven stillet? So if you want a, a guide wire driven, you will prefer for the quick flex. However, if you want a steerable distal tip, so because uh, sometimes it can be difficult to navigate around, especially in the LV area. So then you try to use is a quartet LV lead in fact. Uh, so one of the questions is, as I said, it's like, why? Why is there any need for such multiple choices for the leads? So we need these leads because, as, as we know, so what happens is there can be problems as well. Problems in the sense, we have to think what kind of uh, anatomy are we able to get? Is it a small, short vessel? Or is it a large, low tortuous vessel? So depending upon that, there are various catheters which is available. The star fix for 195, the attainability plus 4296, the attainability 4196, attainability straight, attain uh, performa 4598, or the attain performa 4298, or even 4398. As I said, it depends like how how much is the tortuosity of the vessels or how small or short are the vessels which is available, okay? So can one summarize for me um, what were the indications when we try to think of using uh, the CRT? You can use the chat box as well. Okay. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, Alok. Okay, good. So what are the indications? No, so you're almost there. Okay. No, recurrent VT, no. You guys are almost there, I would say.
Okay. Come on, we had several sessions. So some of the important things is you should try to see oh, are they symptomatic or not. Then for example, the Niha class. Okay. Mm, sick sinus syndrome for CRT. See, pacemaker. See, we need to be able to understand something is called a single chamber pacemaker is different. Okay. Something is called as dual chamber pacemaker, of course, is different. And then comes the triple chamber, you can think. Or recently, even four chamber pacemakers are being advocated. So the CRTs are like the triple chamber pacemaker. So as we had already said it, so there's one in the uh, atrium, one in the ventricle, and the third one comes into the left ventricle. So they are mostly indicated for NIHA class 3 and class 4 patients who are symptomatic despite the stable, optimal heart failure medical therapy and have a left ventricular injection fraction less than 35%. And the QRS duration is pretty much prolonged, okay? However, if someone is having a class 1 or class 2 or 3, but ejection fraction is 50% as well, one can consider, okay? However, before that, uh, one should have already optimized the heart failure medical therapies, okay? Uh, and uh, if they are having an AV block as well, and yes, uh, you would uh, expect to have a high percentage of ventricular pacing that which cannot be managed with the algorithms of the RV pacing. So that is where you try to think like, okay, this is the time you have to try to think for a such kind of patient. So indications we are now aware, okay. Can someone tell like, what are the contraindications which we had discussed earlier? So what are the contraindications? Indications we could understand. So what happens is these uh, CRT devices are contraindicated for concomitant implant with another bradycardia device and concomitant implant with an implantable ICD. Although there are no known contraindications for the usage of pacing as a therapeutic modality to control the heart rate and the patient's age, the medical conditions, however, uh, it may, so patient's age or medical conditions may dictate the particular pacing system, mode of operation and also the implant procedure which is being used by the physician. And the rate responsive modes may be contraindicated in those patients who cannot tolerate the pacing rates uh, above the programmed lower rate. And dual chamber sequential pacing is contraindicated in patients with chronic or persistent supraventricular tachycardia, including the atrial fibrillation or even flutter as well. And asynchronous pacing is contraindicated in the presence of competition between the pace and the intrinsic rhythm. Similarly, a single chamber atrial pacing is contraindicated in a patient with a atrioventricular conduction defect. And yeah, anti-tachycardia pacing is of course uh, contraindicated in a patient with an access-free anterograde pathway. And always uh, uh, we should have some precautions as well in the mind, in the sense like the changes in a patient's disease or medications may alter the efficacy of a, a device's uh, programmed parameters. And the patient should avoid sources of magnetic and electromagnetic radiations to avoid possible underdetection and or inappropriate sensing and or therapy, delivery, tissue damage or even induction of uh, the arrhythmia. And always do not place transthoracic defibrillator paddles 
directly over the device, okay? And additionally, for the CRT IPGs, certain programming and device operations may not provide cardiac resynchronization therapy. So that is why one should be really careful, like when you are using it, how you are using it, and sometimes, yes, a rejection phenomenon can happen, erosions can happen as well, and we should also be aware of the various complications, including the muscle or the nerve stimulation. There can be some oversensing or even failure to detect or terminate the arrhythmia episodes as well, or surgical complications like the hematoma, infection, inflammation, or thrombosis as well. Is that okay? So that's why it's very important to be able to understand as well, like the indications first, like uh, for which kind of patient should it be used, which patients it is better to avoid, okay? How many of you have been able to assist uh, any of these uh, pacemaker implantations and all so far on a practical basis? Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, please, please use the chat box. Sir, I have seen. Okay, sir? you have seen. Yes, sir. I have seen one case, sir, with uh, severe LD dysfunction with LDDT, sir, patient was asymptomatic. Which was Later, she developed an episode of syncope, sir, and we got admitted that case. Okay. And we are planning now for the CRT. So, so, now my one question. When will you normally CRTs are implanted for a left bundle branch block patient? In a patient, sir, with, in a patient with right bundle branch block, when do you implant a CRT? I know her. I don't have yes, yes, for others as well. When can we use for implanting a CRT in a patient with right bundle branch block? So majority of the times what happens is uh, it, it is indicated only for the left bundle branch block. But let me tell you, like, ideally it should not be considered, but there are very, very selective indications, I would say. So what happens is, whenever sometimes uh, the right bundle branch block is masking the left bundle branch block which is characterized by a broad slurred sometimes even notched r wave on one and avl and together with a leftward axis deviation which is frequently noted in the left bundle branch block morphology okay so that is definitely a time one can even think of in fact okay Any other indications? Okay. 
So there are a lot of um, experimental studies as well, which has been uh, uh, done and tried to show as well. So what happens is uh, they didn't show much of the benefits. In fact, there has been some recent studies as well, which has been trying to focus, like if the RBV patients can be helpful, but most of the times they are associated with adverse outcomes. So any, any other indications, if one can think of, or one would like to suggest? So, okay, on an, on an overall basis, let's try to make things simple for you. So what happens is, so far, the available evidences indicate that straightforward application of CRT in patients with right bundle branch block should be discouraged, okay? However, Yes, there is need for additional studies which should be performed as to see a subset of patient with right bundle branch block may benefit from CRT or not. And that is why a pooled analysis of data should be done, in fact, for such kind of patients, which tries to look on the soft uh, and the uh, end outcomes and all for such kind of patients. Anyways, we already diverted enough from our topic. So as I had already said, it is uh, we should try to choose the LV lead depending on the coronary sinus target, vein anatomy, size, tortuosity, and how about the angulation as well. And always remember that we tend to prefer a curved end as, uh, rather than the straight and the LV lead, in fact. And smaller size and more flexible lead is more preferred rather than a bigger size LV lead, unless and until the coronary sinus vein is large and straight, okay? And always make multiple views. More the views, better it is. So you can always achieve at a better rate. So unipolar, bipolar versus the quadripolar leads as well. And uh, always remember, so in quadripolars, of course, you will be having uh, more programmable vectors which can go up to even 16 as well. So uh, more the leads for programming, better uh, will be the outcome because it will reduce the need for the positioning of the LV lead as well. So this is something really important. So now the important thing comes is like how to uh, place the lead. So once we have uh, advanced the lead through the coronary sinus, okay, then we try to see, for example, if it is compatible enough and always try to implant the lead in the target uh, branch vein, okay? So as we can beautifully see in this figure, what so for this, you can try to use different uh, tools you are available, something like the, uh, from Attain group is like 4193, 4194, they are hybrid guide catheters as well. So it will be helpful to add to the agility of the guide wire if there's a stylet in the tool in fact so there are various tools uh, uh, available as well so you try to do is a uh, insert the attain select two inside of the coronary sinus cannulation catheter and then you sub select the branch with attain select two delivery catheter as well and advance a four french lead over wire and uh, you try to see for this, okay? So yeah, yeah, it's options are quite a lot, but the thing is you should be aware what is needed, when is needed. So example, the sub-selector. Sub-selector as well, again, will depend on the venogram uh, which was done. Uh, if you need uh, obtuse or 90 degree support or 90 degree flex, 90 degree standard, or even an acute uh, one in fact as well. There are different rules. So for example, if there is an acute branch, so then you will try to think for using an acute one. However, when you have to think of navigating through the valve, uh, 
you will have to consider the different sub options as well so to be able to understand the anatomy is very very important i hope we are able to understand that okay and after that uh, we should always try to make sure that the electrodes are there in contact with the vein and always test for the thresholds at the lv tip and lv ring as well after the implantation is done of course you have to remove it removing it using make sure you do the lead securement by securing with the thumb pressure and mechanically securing in the lead channel and control the grip with an ergonomic hand position and slit it not just once but twice okay and if you're using a cps universal slitter as you can see try to use a normal hand position and it is uh, in fact compatible with multiple lead diameters as well then of course important thing is to check for the final electricals test the ra rv and the lv leads as well independently and test at the 10 volts of course always for the phrenic or diaphragmatic stimulation as well and after you have done that you should uh, see for the acceptable threshold for the lv lead and depending upon the difficulty of the lead placement and target vessel options you should be careful about uh, uh, how much are you choosing but uh, people tend to prefer on a normal basis less than 1.5 volts in fact so you also try to see how about the pacing vector programmability in the sense for example for the crt devices the available lv pace polarity so for example lv tip to lv ring lv tip to lv ring or lv tip to rv coil or lv ring to the rv coil so these are very very important things and similarly also try to see for the lv pace polarity which can be lv tip to the rv ring and the it can be unipolar or the bipolar options as well and yes uh, you finally of course if you have done that finally you just try to do is connect the icd ports uh, or you have to evaluate them so for example the set screw has not settled down if the set screw is seen you should try to back it with the wrench and always 